Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Keel. I'm the general manager for Bloomberg Green. I'm so pleased to be with you today for our first advisory board spotlight sponsored by Natixis Investment Managers. Joining me today are Natalie Wallace and Joseph Pinto. We're going to have a great conversation. Let's talk ESG, as that video just said. Um, and Joseph, I want to start with you about that. When we say ESG investing, I think there's, there's so many approaches to that. It's such a broad term now. So when you're thinking about this with your clients, how do you define ESG investing? Where do you tell them to start? Hello, Lauren. Yes, indeed, effectively, uh, it always starts with a conversation with clients. And when we talk about clients, there are various customer segments. Uh, we can think about insurance companies, pension funds, banking distributors towards, you know, pushing products towards end uh, customers. So the conversation go for a long time, actually. And ultimately, if I want to summarize uh, the key takeaways in simple words, uh, it all goes down to two topics when we uh, think about clients. First is to try to identify uh, the client's ESG preference. What do they want from an ESG standpoint? It requests a long discussion with them. It depends again on the customer segment. Some are more advanced than others. And two, the risks attached of not doing, going into the ESG space. Some companies may have some physical risks. Some would like to effectively reduce the temperature of their portfolio, so on and so forth. So those two topics, in a nutshell, are in the mind of clients, independently of the sophistication of that client. And then we come, we come up with, uh, once we understand the client needs on those two aspects, we come up with solutions that uh, are tailored to their needs. Uh, um, and also, we also engage with them on, let's say, uh, the temperature of their portfolios, the energy transition, which creates a great opportunity for them to eventually allocate their money differently and enter into that space more deeply. Uh, and the best way for us to do that is, again, providing the right solutions there and also give them, while promoting products, all the transparency they need in terms of understanding how each product effectively can report on the ESNG factor and how they can basically read what's behind each product. That's pretty much how the conversation goes with clients. And do you feel like that conversation has been changing? Well, uh, if you refer to the past events, which are for, for sure from a humanitarian standpoint terrible, uh, it is true that every client has been asking us the same question. But ultimately, um, this is a long-term trend to stay. Uh, I was actually two weeks ago in Australia and in Singapore visiting clients in the UK here as well, in continental Europe as well, last week in the US, the conversation is still the same. It's here to stay for the long term, and clients understand that it's a trend that they have to engage into, and they must move on no matter what. And they understand the benefit of it. So that's why that conversation, frankly, uh, even if it has been disturbed because of the war, they were all of us and them preoccupied on a number of other elements first, but it went back again now to the discussion of ESG. Natalie, I want to bring you in on this topic that, that Joseph just raised about Russia's war in Ukraine. What impact is that having on the ESG investing space? Yes, um, obviously the, the, the war in Ukraine is, is a humanitarian crisis. Um, it, it reminds us, and it's a wake-up call, that um, you know, democratic values um, should be preserved. Um, and, and that's with that mind um, that, if anything, um, we're seeing clients actually accelerating. Uh, their, their, we expect to see acceleration of investment in, uh, in the transition. Um, before the war, there were three key drivers for the transition, the energy transition especially, which were regulation, consumer demand, and technological advances. Now there is a, a fourth element to that, which is energy security and independence. So we actually expect acceleration of investment into renewable energy and renewable solutions. So all our clients are exposed to that from a fi to, to finance that transition and to the f exposed to the investment trends that um, the, these government actions are going to create for, for investors. And maybe to add what just Natalie said, I mean, clients are not blind. They've seen the oil prices, you know, uh, increase, they've seen the impact on their portfolios, which is the opposite of what happened over the past few years. Uh, despite that, they are still making the difference between what the short-term impact is versus the long-term. And they did confirm to us, as much as we've I've been saying before, this is a secular trend, it's staying, and it's clear in the mind of clients as well. 
we, we have this title about active investors. So I want to really t touch on that theme with you, Natalie. Tell us why do we need active investors in the ESG investing space? Well, we think um, active invest investment as well as engagement with portfolio companies is the best way to affect change. Um, I just want to remind uh, one, one quick fact. Portfolio do not emit CO2. It's the portfolio companies within portfolios that do emit CO2. So well, to drive change, to drive decarbonization of the economy, we need to engage with uh, companies in our portfolio to, uh, to reduce carbon footprint overall of our portfolio as well as the real economy. So active engagement is key. We've seen through you know, many actors in the place, especially one, one small hedge fund based in New York called Engine One, uh, who was actually able to, uh, to really have an impactful engagement and proxy voting season to remove few board members on a, on a large oil company based in the US. So th this is really the, the way we think we can position for the future, for a sustainable future, the portfolios of our clients, as well as um, affect change uh, within the real world. Joseph, I'd love to hear the same thing from you. Why do you feel like that active approach is necessary? Well, I mean, simply by discussing again with clients. And then uh, when we talk to them about it, they understand the benefit of uh, active investing. Uh, they embrace exactly what Nathalie said before. And probably come back to also the first question. The maturity of clients is definitely you know, varying from one continent to the other. We know that usually in Europe, clients stand, the topic tends to be more advanced than elsewhere. Um, but I can tell you that, again, picking the example of Asian insurance clients that I met three weeks ago, they were extremely knowledgeable of what's going on in Europe. They were very keen in having more active investing in their portfolios and being accompanied by any asset manager in helping them in that energy transition journey and also measuring the temperature of their portfolios, reallocating their money differently, but doing their own way at their own pace while observing how the rest of the world is moving on it. And what do you think is driving that interest in them? They are doing it because they look at the risk attached to not doing it. And actually, uh, remember again, you know, without giving too much details, the last conversation with a CIO, chief investment officer of that same insurance company. And actually the question became very quickly when we went down to the details of how can you help me, me the chief investment officer, have a constructive dialogue with my risk manager? Because the risk is observing what I'm doing. I need also to educate them. It is not that easy. So can you give me the tools to help them understand why I need to change the way I manage money today compared to the past? And how can I effectively bring the rest of the company with me in doing so? So it's a lot of energy, a lot of work in terms of education. Even sophisticated clients need to be educated and themselves also have to bring their own internal ecosystem into that journey. And Natalie, Joseph talked about education in this space. Do you feel like there's questions that people should be asking that they're not asking about ESG investing? Yes, um, open the hood and, and look under in the products. I mean, transparency, as Joseph said, and communication on the ESG or climate or social objective of a, of a product is extremely important. Um, we, we've heard all about you know, the risk of greenwashing from corporate issuers, but also from, from asset managers. So understanding what the product does, um, is it to protect against ESG risks? Is it to contribute to um, in, you know, long-term environmental and social change? It's really important to communicate clearly. We, we see the regulation moving that way with SFDR. But communication, transparency, reporting are extremely important tools to, uh, to again, to support the claims that an investment product uh, with an ESG or climate or, or sustainable objective um, is, is, is embedded into that product. It's really important for investors to ask, clients to ask. Great. We have just about one more minute together, so I'd like to ask both of you to kind of look ahead to the year ahead. What do you think is going to be big in the ESG investing space? Natalie. Um, I think continuation or acceleration of the trends we've seen in the past. Um, we are all under uh, huge scrutiny from the regulators in terms of communication on our ESG products. That's true in, the, in, in Europe. Uh, it's true in the UK. It's also becoming true now in the US with the SEC that is expected to announce um, ESG product guidelines on how to communicate to end investors. Um, the other point that is, I think, really critical is increased transparency on corporate issuers, especially around climate risk. 
uh, with the SEC just announced that a few weeks back. The, the UK obviously uh, advanced on that and then European as well um, next year. So over the next two to three years, more transparency, more communication, both from corporate issuers and from uh, ESG uh, investment managers. And if I may add to what Nathalie said, probably it is true that all the sophisticated investors have understood it and they are moving their own pace, but they are moving forward. I think us as asset managers or intermediaries, we're going to have to do a lot of work to educate our clients through distributors for sure. So the topic of educating private clients who need to understand better what is at stake and how do they want to also express their own ESG preference, what's the risk attached to it, will be key moving forward uh, on top of what institutional clients are looking for as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Joseph. And thank you so much again to Natixis Investment Managers for sponsoring the Spotlight. Thank you, Lauren. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.